Well, good evening, everybody. It has been uh, just a glorious day in West Tennessee. Uh, in fact, the news said uh, we, we've had some of the warmest days this October uh, so far uh, over the last couple of days. It's supposed to be warm and nice again tomorrow, but uh, we know what it does in, in West Tennessee. The weather changes uh, almost daily, but it has been beautiful today. We're thankful for that, and I'm thankful to have this opportunity tonight to come together here at HMBC for uh, Wednesday night Bible study. We have a little larger crowd this evening than we had last week, and uh, I expected that, anticipated that, and, and hopefully we'll grow gradually, and, uh, and, and I, I just thank the Lord for you all. We have some children here tonight. Brother Trey Cruz is with them, and uh, so we're thankful for all of those blessings. Now, last Sunday morning, uh, we had a rainy Sunday. And we had uh, some problems with our FM transmitter. Uh, my neighbor, Audie, called me uh, Sunday night and he said, well, he said, you kept fading in, fading out. And I thought, well, I had my microphone with me every step I took. <laughs> and, uh, but the transmitter uh, went a little haywire Sunday. Harold and I spoke about it, initially thought maybe it was the rain. Uh, that was causing it, but Brother Harold came over here Monday morning, and we're blessed, folks. Uh, Brother Harold is just, he's got a, uh, he, he just got a handle on all this elect electronic stuff, but he figured out we had a bad wire. So for the benefit of everybody that will watch this video, if you've been sitting in your car or in the parking pavilion or here in the uh, meditation garden, we think we've got the problem worked out. So uh, hopefully we won't have that difficulty anymore. And then I'm going to send out a one call uh, to make sure that we um, make contact with as many people as we can about our FM transmitter. Hopefully the problem is fixed and uh, it's been working out very well. So just make a note of that. We want to have prayer this evening and uh, want you to remember in prayer um, Joe Harrington is home from the hospital. We're thankful for that. I spoke with uh, Tina Renfro uh, this morning, and she said her and Larry were doing very well. They've had kind of a tough time. Said Miss Carolyn was doing better, and uh, they're, they're, they're pretty sure they're going to put her through uh, the swing bed program. They're not going to change her room, but they're going to put her through the swing bed program, hopefully build up her uh, strength a little bit. But she is doing better. All three of them have the coronavirus. Uh, Jimmy Simpson was telling me about his uh, neighbors having coronavirus. We want to remember all of them in, in prayer. Uh, and, and, of course, let's remember all of our church family. Prayer requests before we pray. Anybody? Unsaved. Let's remember the unsaved. Um, let's please uh, pray for them. Always their need is far greater than, than, than any other that we can imagine. So let's pray for the unsaved. Anyone else? The Megs family and the Williams family. The Megs family and the Williams family. Our heart goes out to them that have lost their, their loved ones for sure. Let's remember to pray for them. Any others? <clears throat> the family of Edna Watson. All right. Let's remember the family of Edna Watson. All right? Okay. If you would, join me in a word of prayer. Holy Father, we are grateful tonight for your blessings. And we ask, Lord, tonight that you would uh, be with us in this Bible study. We thank you for uh, our church. We thank you for the church family that you've given to us, for the fellowship that we enjoy together and our friendship and, and love for each other. Lord, we're thankful for the privilege to be able to worship you and, and serve you. Uh, Lord, we know that this is a time of, of great trial, uh, of great um, uh, worry and concern. Uh, people are sick, uh, especially with this virus that has come upon us. And we pray for your grace, Lord, and healing uh, for them, for everyone that is uh, uh, exposed to this virus and for all the other medical needs that we have. We pray especially for the unsaved. Lord, we know that we have work to do as your disciples here to be a light in the world, a witness to all men. We thank you most of all for Jesus, our Savior, Lord. And we pray that you would give us grace and guidance as we strive to serve you. Forgive us where we fail you. And bless our efforts tonight. Bless this study for the glory of Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Mysteries of the Bible. Um, titled my message tonight, The Angel of the Lord. 
Uh, you'll see this expression in the Bible in several places. I'm going to read here in the book of Genesis, chapter 16. Uh, we read these verses, I think, a few weeks ago, uh, but this will bring us back in, in contact with this expression, the angel of the Lord. This is the first time that it appears in the Bible. In fact, the matter is, uh, it, it is the first time the word angel appears uh, in the Bible. Now, when you read in Genesis chapter uh, 3, as that chapter closes, when the Lord drove Adam and Eve out of the garden, uh, cherubim were placed there. The word cherubim, of course, we know from our study, is referring to angels. But this is the first scripture uh, where the word angel, literally the word angel, appears in scripture. Um, Genesis 16, 1 tells us, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. She had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee, I have given my maid into thy bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand to do, do to her, he said, as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. Verse 7. This is the verse I wanted to get to. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness by the fountain in the way uh, to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself unto her, uh, under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. I'm going to stop reading there at verse 11. And I want us to take a look at this expression tonight, the angel of the Lord. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, you see this expression several times, uh, particularly in the Old Testament. Now, uh, I mentioned the benefits of Bible study. You know, there's no substitute, brothers and sisters, for personal Bible study. If all we're doing uh, as far as the Bible, and, and I'll, I'll say this, I, I will confess. You know, I grew up in a preacher's home um, and I was grown and I never really seriously attempted to read the Bible growing up. I had a Bible and it was there, could have read it any time, but I just made no serious effort to do that. In fact, the matter is when I was called in the ministry, you know, I was pretty much biblically illiterate as far as my own personal study was concerned. What I knew about the Bible was simply what I had heard somebody else say. And if that's all that we're doing in our Christian life, we're missing the boat. You know, there's just no substitute for personal Bible study. Now, there's benefit for corporate Bible study, which is what we're doing tonight. But personal Bible study is vastly important. You know, you need a space uh, at, at your home, somewhere where you can go, you know, get away from, from distractions, clear your head, where you can sit and read and study and meditate on God's Word. God speaks to us through His Word, you know. And so 
personal Bible study is of the utmost importance. However, group Bible study, you know, they have their own benefits. Uh, in the course of this study, as we've been studying about different types of angels, man would ask, has, has asked me several questions at home. We've not been together in a group session, you know, so uh, she's been firing away questions uh, at me. Well, did you think about herald angels, you know? Um, and, and that's a word that sticks in, in, in our mind as, as being biblical or the death angel, you know? And that terminology, the death angel, is something that sticks in our mind that, should, that we think should be biblical. But as we discussed last week, those expressions exactly like that, they're not in the Bible. You know, all the angels are ministering spirits and, and th their purpose is to uh, bring messages to us and watch over us and help guide us. So there are herald angels, but there are no verses of Scripture that specifically states that they are herald angels. So that's the benefit of, of studying our Bibles together because you all think in a different way than I do. In fact, we all think in, in, in different directions, in different ways. And everybody uh, has, has questions, you know. It's just uh, kids that come into the world, you know, the, the first, one of the first words that comes out of their mouth nearly is why. You know, why is the sky blue? Why is the grass green? And, and, and we all have questions. And what those questions do, you've heard the, the saying, there are no dumb questions, there are just dumb answers. Um, you know, people's questions gets us thinking in a different direction, looking in a di different direction. And very often, brothers and sisters, being able to look or see in a different direction or perspective is extremely valuable. So that's the benefit of our coming together and, and, and studying the Bible together. Uh, praise the Lord, and, and we're here tonight. Guardian angels is, is another one, you know. We all talk about, uh, you know, ha have talked about or heard about guardian angels. I've told the story many times about the black preacher who said he had two guardian angels and he knew what their names was and he quoted Psalm 23, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And it's not out of the realm of possibility that there's an angel named grace or an angel named mercy, who knows. Uh, but this, this idea of guardian angels is planted firmly in our, in our mind and, and a lot of times we just get to think, well, it is biblical when actually that terminology is not biblical. Another point that I want to make here in Bible study, you've heard me say this uh, as well, a rule of thumb. What's a rule of thumb? You know, years ago they used to use the thumb to measure things with. Uh, in a lot of circumstances. And, and that expression, rule of thumb, it's become uh, just a familiar figure of speech for us. A rule of thumb is a, is a vital principle. And one of the vital principles or rules of thumb for Bible study is context is king. Context is king. You're going to see that in, in this study tonight, that the context of what we're reading about dictates what we're actually describing or talking about. Uh, this word, uh, this expression, the angel of the Lord, you'll find it in several different circumstances, but it's the context of what you read that in that dictates exactly what it means, okay? Context is king. The time period. The setting, the literal or symbolic, sometimes we might read scripture that are, that are to be understood and applied literally, sometimes they're to be understood or applied uh, symbolically. And that context will dictate the exact meaning of what is said. And whenever we're reading our Bible, we have to try to, to, to get our minds around exactly what is being said in the time period in which it was written. Because 2,000, 4,000 years later, our understanding of the same words might be totally different than what their understanding of the same words meant. We all know tonight, don't we, that words change their meaning over time. You've heard me say this, don't throw away your old dictionaries. Why? Because the original meaning 
of, of a lot of words are in those old dictionaries, not the new ones. Words become obsolete. Uh, they become archaic. You know, the, 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 the literal meaning of the word becomes archaic. It becomes out of use because it's not used in the same way in our time period. So that's just a rule of thumb. Context is king. And we're going to take a look at the context uh, here of this expression, the angel of the Lord. Guardian angels, though not mentioned specifically in Scripture, the concept is fully fixed in our minds. We know that. Um, in first and second Kings chapter six, um, Elisha, um, he saw, you know, his, his servant. They're surrounded by the enemy. And his, his servant says, Master, what are we going to do? And the, Elisha the prophet prayed that the Lord would open his eyes. And that servant saw the mountains around them filled with angels. And those angels, that army of angels was sent there to do what? To guard them, to protect them. But the expression guardian angel is not there. But that's just a, a, a one a, example. In Mark chapter 4 and verse 11, when Jesus went through uh, the 40 days and 40 nights uh, of fasting and praying in the wilderness and the devil came and tempted him. At the end of that time period, and finally the devil left him because the Lord resisted his temptations and he resisted those temptations by telling the devil, it's written. You know, he quoted scripture. It's written in God's word. This is what we should do. You know, we're to worship God and him only shall we serve. Uh, and at the end of that temptation, the devil left him. And then the scriptures tells us that the angels came and ministered unto the Lord. You know, and, and, and even in that role, brothers and sisters, those angels were guardian angels. They were looking out for the Lord's welfare there in that temptation. Now, uh, we find several uh, verses of Scripture, uh, you know, that, that, that tell us. And when the Lord quoted that, that Scripture, it is written, you know, thou shalt worship the Lord and him only shalt thou serve. He was quoting from Psalm 91, verses 11 and verse 12. Or when he was told, you know, cast yourself down. That's this, the Psalm 91 tells us this. And the devil says, cast yourself down because it's written that uh, the, the Lord has given his angels charge over you, lest you should dash your foot against a stone. That's found in Psalm 91, verse 11. Um, quoting scripture, uh, again, but the angels there, they ministered to the Lord. They, they protected him. And we find uh, in, in various different places in, in the Bible where it talks about a, any number of angels. Um, seven uh, in, in Revelation uh, chapter eight and verse two, it mentions, uh, I think, about nine times in Revelation about uh, angels blowing trumpets. Um, wh when you hear a trumpet sound, what is that? What is the word for that? When you hear a trumpet sound, it's a what? It's a what? Herald. It's a herald. Exactly. Exactly. In the book of Joel, the Joel the prophet says, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm. It's a, it's a herald. It's, a, it's an alarm. It's a, it, it's a warning. It's an alert. And we see that picture in the book of Revelation, particularly in the seventh seal, where these seven angels are given seven trumpets. And then it talks about those angels sounding, sounding the, the, the trumpets. And these seven angels there, mentioned nine times in Revelation, the article the, T-H-E, the article the, suggests something specific about these particular angels. Um, and there are seven angels mentioned there. Perhaps it's referring to familiarity. Maybe these particular seven angels were around the throne of God there in Revelation uh, all the time worshiping the Lord. I don't know. Maybe it refers to rank or maybe it refers to station or uh, it's just uncertain. But it refers to the seven angels. They were given seven trumpets uh, and they were commanded at a certain time to sound. In the apocryphal books, we talked about this. How many archangels are there? How many archangels? Anybody want to guess? How many? Two? 
I heard, I've heard, I heard somebody say three. Anybody else? One. One. Okay. The only angel mentioned in Scripture specifically as being an archangel is Michael. Michael, okay? Now, in Bible study, what can we rely on as being the absolute truth? The Bible. You got the right answer. The Bible. Well, in the book of Enoch, this is an apocryphal book. Um, we've talked about these books uh, that are included in some translations of the Bible in between the Old and New Testaments, the Apocrypha. There are several of them. In the book of Enoch, there are seven specific angels mentioned there, referred to as archangels, okay? Um, I can't pronounce their names very well, but they're listed in the book of Enoch in chapter 20 and verse 7. Uh, Raphael, Ra Ragel, Michael, Sariel, Gabriel, Remiel, that's the names given. But we cannot say absolutely for certain that that's true because this particular book is not recognized as being inspired scripture. Biblically, the only angel that we can absolutely say is an archangel is Michael because he's the only one that's mentioned in God's inspired word. Uh, then again in Revelation chapter 7, there's referred to four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Is the earth square? No. It's not square, is it? When it's referring to the four corners of the earth, most logically it's referring to north, south, east, and west. And Revelation talks about these four angels standing at those points on, on the earth there in, in, in Revelation. Uh, the, there's no article here, though, like the seven angels. In Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1, it just speaks about four angels standing at the four corners of the world. So the difference is between uh, the, the, the seven angels is this little article, the. You know, that word the gives some specificity, if I'm saying that word correctly. Some significance. Some significance. But the four angels, there's no article the in connection with them. It's just referring to four particular angels. I don't want to use the word average or ordinary because there aren't any angels that are average or ordinary. But there's nothing there in the context of that that says these particular angels are anything extraordinary. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, when it comes to, um, in, in the first chapter of, of Revelation, John is on the Isle of Patmos. He says he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. Uh, he hears a voice behind him that, that speaks to him and he says, I am Alpha and Omega. And of course we know who's speaking there. Um, and, and John says he turns to hear the voice that's speaking with him and he sees this, this person that is all engulfed in this, in this brilliant light. Uh, he describes the person of Christ uh, as being like, he, he's on fire nearly. His hair is, is white. His feet like burnished or burning brass. Uh, his eyes like flames of fire. And he's clothed in white. And he says he's walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And he says he's holding in his hands. I don't know if you can see maybe in that image there uh, that he's holding in his hands seven stars. Okay. And then later on in that particular chapter, uh, Jesus speaks to John and he tells him the mystery of the seven golden candlesticks. And he begins to un, uh, describe or unfold this mystery of what he saw. So you've, you've, you've read the verses before. You've, you've heard the verses before. Here's a picture of Jesus Christ, the, the, the glorified Christ, walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. What are those seven candlesticks? Anybody? Churches. They're churches. Jesus is... Yeah, that's right. 
Jesus is walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3 follows with an individual letter that the Lord commands John to write to these seven churches. And he tells him in the first chapter, the mystery of those seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches of Asia. Now, here's a picture of a map of Asia Minor, it's modern day Turkey, and where those churches might have, or were located, kind of in a circular pattern. And the Lord says the mystery of those seven golden candlesticks is the fact that they are seven churches. And then he's commanded to write a letter to each one of those churches. I'm gonna back up just a little bit. And he's holding in his right hand seven stars. And the Lord tells him, that those seven stars are what? Did anyone remember? Those seven stars are the angels of the churches or the angels of those candlesticks. All right? So in the context of what we're reading here, are we literally talking about angels? These, um, these uh, awesome, powerful, uh, spiritual creatures, are they literally angels? Or are they something else? I see eyebrows going this way. They're literally angels, I'm hearing them say. Well, I'm going to tell you, most biblical scholars believe that those seven angels of the seven churches are pastors. They are the messengers of the church. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. Pastors are not angels, okay? But in this particular symbolic uh, context, those seven golden candlesticks represent seven churches. And those seven stars are seven angels or seven messengers or seven pastors of those churches, okay? Uh, you can check that out if you want to, but most biblical scholars refer to them as being the pastors of those, of those churches. And John is given a message to send to each one of those messengers to deliver to each one of those churches. And they, they carry a powerful message even for the churches today. Now, let's back up to, to, to Genesis chapter 16. We're reading about here Abraham and Sarah before their names were changed. It was Sarai and Abram, <clears throat> but it's literally Sarah and Abraham. You know the story. Sarah's barren. She can't have any children. She knows physically She's not able to have children, even though God had made a promise that they would have. Um, she gives her handmaid, Hagar, to Abraham at that particular time, which in that culture, you know, it would offend our culture today, but in that culture, it was a common practice to do. Um, and Abraham has a child with Hagar, and uh, that child's name is Ishmael. We know who he grows up to be. Uh, he is the father of all the Arab countries, Arab nations that exist in the world today. There's prophecy here that I did not read to you where uh, the Lord reveals to Hagar that her son, Ishmael, is going to be a wild man. That he is going to live um, in conflict with everybody around him. Gee, uh, did, that, did that prophecy come to pass? It absolutely has, hasn't it? And folks, listen, in our, in our world today, we can see this, this scripture here in, in Genesis chapter 16. We can see it fulfilling. We can see it fulfilling. And, and, and the descendants of Ishmael have lived in conflict with every, every nation and every people around them ever since this time. It, it absolutely was fulfilled. But the thing I want you to see here you know, we've, we've been studying about angels, and here it talks about the angel of the Lord. And the question that I want to ask you uh, in, in this context, are we talking about an ordinary angel? Are we talking about one of these winged creatures that, you know, the, the, the seraphim or the, um, uh, the archangel? Are we, are we talking about one of those creatures, or are we talking about somebody else? In the context of what we're reading, is this literally just an angel or is it somebody else? Uh, let me give you some examples here. In Genesis chapter 18, 
uh, we read this a few weeks ago. Abraham's sitting in his tent, and he notices coming down the road three men. And Genesis tells us that it was three men. Abraham's curiosity is aroused. He gets up and he runs down the road to meet these three men. And he bows on the, on the ground before them. And, and he calls one of them Lord. Okay? Never in the context... Of, of those three men visiting Abraham, does it mention the word angel? But in, in Genesis chapter 19 and verse 1, two angels just happened to go down and show up at Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, in their visit with Abraham in Genesis chapter 18, one of them says, Shall I hide from Abraham that which I do? And you know the story. Abraham begins pleading with him for Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's literally pleading with who? An angel? Or is he pleading with the Lord? He's pleading with the Lord, isn't he? Yes. And we, and we understand that from the, the, from the context that it's written. He's pleading with the Lord. Okay? Uh, in Genesis chapter... Um, 16 here that, that I read to you tonight, notice in, in verse 7 where it says, And the angel of the Lord found her, Hagar, by the fountain of water. And he begins to speak to her. And in this context, he tells her, this angel of the Lord says to her, I will bless thy seed. I'm going to bless your seed. Well, the, the angel of the Lord didn't tell her, the Lord is going to bless your seed. That angel of the Lord said, I'm going to bless your seed. And that angel of the Lord revealed to her that her son was going to be a great man, that he was going to be a wild man, and that he would live in conflict with everybody else. And so in this context, brothers and sisters, we're not talking about an ordinary angel. In this context, I honestly believe we're talking about the Lord himself. The same way as it was in Genesis chapter 18, when Abraham sees these three men. Now, when you go over in the book of Revelation, and an angel of the Lord appears to, to, to John, the revelator in Revelation, John said he fell down and began to worship that angel. He fell down at his feet to worship the angel. What did that angel do? Do you remember? In the, in the book of Revelation, what did he say? Don't do that. Don't do that. Why? Because, he said, I am one of thy fellow servants. And that's exactly what an angel is. is a, a servant. He's a servant of God. And he's also a servant of men. And we understand from the context of that, brothers and sisters, that we're forbidden to worship angels. There are people in the world, sadly, that do worship angels, but according to the scripture, we're forbidden to do that. This angel that came to, to visit Abraham, these three men that came to visit Abraham, when Abraham ran down the road and bowed before him uh, and referred to him, Lord, that particular person did not forbid Abraham from worshiping him. And as you read the context of that, and Abraham's uh, bartering with, with the Lord about Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, I will not destroy the city if I find ten righteous people there. When that episode closes, Genesis chapter 19 opens with two angels showing up at Sodom and Gomorrah. Where did the third one go? Why, it, 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 you know, if it, was the, if it was the same group, why wasn't there three there in Genesis chapter 19 when we closed Genesis chapter 18 with three of them? The context suggests that that particular angel, the angel of the Lord, was the Lord himself, okay? Uh, and there are other examples of this. In Genesis chapter 31, you remember the story of... of um, Jacob um, swindling his brother uh, Esau out of his birthright. Uh, 
because of that, and, and Esau swore that he was going to kill Jacob, you know. But we need to understand in the context of that, Esau wasn't going to kill Jacob until his father died, okay. And Jacob fled from there. His mother talked him into fleeing there and going over to stay with, with her, her brother uh, Laban, and he did, okay. And on his way there, Jacob stops at a place that he calls Bethel. Anyone know what the name Bethel means? We've got lots of churches named Bethel. Bethel Baptist, Bethel Missionary Baptist. I grew up in Bethel Missionary Baptist Church in Toledo, Ohio. Do you know what the name Bethel means? House of what? The house of bread. No. Bethlehem is the house of bread. Good, good guess, though. Bethel means the house of the Lord. Jacob said, this is none other than the house of the Lord, the gate to heaven. And what was it Jacob saw while he was there? He had a vision. He fell asleep. He made a, made a pillow out of a rock, and he fell asleep, and he, and he had a dream. What did he see? A ladder. A ladder, sure. Jacob's ladder. And what was on that ladder? Angels ascending and descending from heaven. Okay, well, Jacob goes on. He spends a number of years with, <clears throat> with Laban. He marries both Rachel and Leah, has lots of kids. Uh, he has lots of cattle. He's now a wealthy man. He decides, you know, the Lord told him it's, it's time to go back uh, to, to, to Canaan, back to Israel. And Jacob starts back there. And in Genesis chapter 31, he has another vision. And the angel of the Lord, or excuse me, it's not mentioned the angel of the Lord. It says the angel of God. Well, all of the angels are angels of God, are they not? Mm -hmm. Okay, but again, context dictates the, the meaning of what we're reading. And in Genesis chapter 31, verses 11 and 13, I need to move on here a little bit. Um, yeah. <coughs> the angel of the Lord. In Genesis chapter 31, verses 11 through 13, the angel of God spoke to Jacob in a dream, saying, I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointed the pillar. Okay, now it says the angel of God, but that angel of God says, I am the God of Bethel. When, I, when Jacob had that dream, and he saw that ladder and the angels ascending and, and descending. He woke up in a terror. And he said, this is, this is none other than the house of God, the gateway to heaven. All right. When he's on his way back to Canaan, I'm about to step off this platform. When, when he's on his way back to Canaan, the Lord appears to him in a dream. And he says, I'm the God of, of Bethel. You see what I'm saying? In the context of this, this is no ordinary angel we're reading about here. That's why when we're reading scripture, we've got to be careful about context. Because here, the Lord appears to Jacob in a dream and says, I'm God. I'm the God of Bethel. I'm the God, you know, it's, it's as much as saying I'm the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Uh, I, you know, I'm the God of Israel. Um, he said, I, I'm the God of Bethel. He reveals himself in this dream as being God and, and not an ordinary angel. So the, the title for my lesson tonight in the, in the mysteries of the Bible, the angel of the Lord, sometimes is not talking about a literal angel, but it's talking about the Lord himself. OK, you remember the story when uh, Israel finally crosses the Jordan River? And goes into Canaan. Um, they, the Lord brought them to, brought them to the Jordan River uh, right away after they left Mount Sinai. And he says, here it is. This is what I've been promising you. Now go in and take it. They sent spies over there and they came back terrified. They said, oh, we can't do that. There's giants over there. And their unbelief caused them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until all that generation died except um, uh, Joshua and Caleb. Forty years later, the Lord brings them back to the Jordan River. They cross the river, and they're just about to go into Canaan and take it, you know, and they're encamped by uh, Jericho. Joshua's leading the camp because Moses has died. And that night, 
walking around the camp of Israel, Joshua sees in a, in a, in a vision a man standing with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua asked him, he said, are you for us or are you for, against us? You know, he sees a man standing there. Are you for us or are you against us? And the man standing there with a sword in his hand said, Nay, but as captain of the Lord's host am I now come. Okay? It doesn't say in there that he's an angel of the Lord. It just simply he refers to himself as the captain of the Lord's host. Many biblical scholars, myself included, believe that, that what Joshua saw that night was what we refer to as a Christophany, an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ himself. Now, when Abraham saw the angel of the Lord, uh, when Jacob saw the angel of God, those are likely the same thing. They are Christophanies, Old Testament appearances of Christ himself. Not ordinary angels, but the angel or the very presence of God himself in the Old Testament. Um, the image of God. And, and, and God's word is still true when it says, no man hath seen God at any time. The, the, the presence of the Lord was masked or veiled in these angelic creatures that were there. But they accepted the worship of Abraham. They accepted the worship of, uh, 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 of Joshua. In fact, the matter is, in the context of, of Joshua 5 and verse 13, we hear this person say to Joshua, put off your shoe because the place where you're standing is holy. Where did we hear that before? Moses. Moses where, Brother Smith? At the burning bush. At the burning bush. As soon as Moses approached that burning bush, that's what he heard the Lord say. Moses, take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground. This creature that Joshua saw on that occasion said the very same thing to him, you know, which, which leads us to believe this is no ordinary angel that we're seeing here. This is, this is a, a, an image of, of the Lord himself. Abraham saw the three angels. Hagar saw the angel of the Lord, um, the angel of the Lord in Genesis chapter 22 uh, stops Abraham from taking Isaac's life. There's that expression again, the angel of the Lord may very well have been the Lord himself on that particular occasion. And then Joshua, uh, Jacob saw the, the angels ascending to heaven and reveals himself in, in a dream to, to, to Jacob later. I'm the God of Bethel. I'm the God of that house, that gateway that you saw. Um, and so we see in the Old Testament these appearances of the Lord himself. That's why when, when you're reading the Bible, we talk about the importance of, of context. We're not talking about ordinary angels here um, or these angelic creatures that um, the, the, the cherubim and the seraphim and the archangels. We're talking about something entirely different, something entirely greater than that. Um, and when they accepted the worship, and we see that the angel in the book of Revel Revelation tell John, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't worship angels. Worship God. So you see the difference in the two. I have one more example next week that I want to share with you about, um, about these, the, the angels in, in a very unique context. OK, and, and these particular occasions here are unusual in the Old Testament. Uh, the Lord tells us in the New Testament about Abraham, that Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Um, and I kind of understand by his expression there when he said Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Abraham likely rejoiced thinking about seeing the Lord's day about someday seeing the Lord. You remember when, when, when Job was, was so sick, you know, uh, and, and, and in Job chapter 14, he said, ask the question, if a man die, shall he live again? In the context of what he was saying there, he said, I know my Redeemer lives, and I know one day I'm going to see him for myself. 
You know, I'm going to see him standing on the earth. I'm going to see him in myself in, in this body. Well, Abraham likely rejoiced thinking about the day when he would see the Lord just like us. But the Lord said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it. And he was glad, uh, suggesting the fact that Abraham in his own time saw the Lord in, in some way. I gave you several examples there. Uh, when he, when the Lord, the angel of the Lord came to his tent, or perhaps when uh, Isaac was uh, uh, ready to be sacrificed, Abraham saw the Lord. He saw him by faith, of course, but he saw him, he, he saw him in, in a, a, a visual form um, as well. And, and the Lord makes reference to that. So in the context of that, these were no ordinary angels. They were appearances of the Lord in the, in the Old Testament. Uh, we'll talk about another unusual one next week in our study. Question or comment before we close tonight? I think it's interesting uh, where, when Jacob wrestles that angel, which is one of my favorites. Yes. Places, the place he wrestled in him, my Bible says, was in Peniel, P-E-N-I-E-L, which translates to literally the face of God. Yes, yes. Yeah, and, and we read about later, Laura, Jacob wrestling with what? An angel? The Bible doesn't talk to us about Jacob wrestling with an angel, does it? No, he wrestled with the Lord. You know, he wrestled with the Lord. So that was no ordinary angel either uh, in, in that particular uh, case as well. Um, I know sometimes it, it, it may seem a, a little bit confusing, uh, but just, you know, giving some thought to these, these occasions here, you know, people in the, in the Old Testament, they saw, they saw visions of God. They had occasions where uh, they actually experienced the Lord. Now, uh, John tells us in, uh, in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, no man has seen God at any time. I haven't seen him, but I've had occasions in my life a few times where, I mean, you know, I, I just, I just felt like I am right in the very presence of God himself. Uh, it was an awesome, awesome experience. I, I, I wish I had more of them. And, and, and I know whose fault that is that I, that I haven't. It, it's mine. And I mentioned Sunday that we live beneath our privilege. You know, that's the benefit, brothers and sisters, of personal Bible study. Because sitting at home by yourself with your Bible, you know, your, your head cleared of all the cares of, of this life and, and, and reading and meditating on God's Word. That's the way God, God speaks to us. That's the way God reveals Himself to us. That's the way we experience the Lord. And I mean, sometimes it just feels like God just moves right in right next to you, you know, and, and, and you're there in, in, in the presence of the Lord. I can tell you um, lots and lots of times um, I've been blessed by sermons that God has given to me way more than anybody sitting out there listening to me, you know, and, and, and before, before I, I would, would try to preach it, you know, I, I just, uh, it, it's just like you, you're, 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 you're transported to some other place in, in some other circumstance. It's awesome. And, and you can have those experiences in your personal Bible study at home. Anybody else? Question, comment before we close. Again, uh, thank you so much for, for coming tonight. Um, you know, this, this, this is just such a, a wonderful privilege to have. To think tonight that we have a place where we can gather, that we have a wonderful book like this to, to read that, that contains God's Word. Uh, just driving over here tonight, I was listening to the radio, uh, another preacher talking about uh, how important God's Word is. And, and, and he said, you know, this is, is of course, God's written Word, um, but this is, this is the mind of God written on these pages, how God thinks and, and, and how God is. And, and, and we can sit and, and, and read and, and meditate and just... I don't know, just, just breathe that in, you know. God's, God's life, His very power and, 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 and holiness is breathed into these wonderful words. It, and look, one of these days, the Lord's coming, you know, in, in the clouds of glory with all those holy angels with Him. Um, 
His presence is going to outshine the sun. We talked about these angels being angels of light. Well, Jesus' light is going to far outshine those hundred million plus angels when, when they come from glory. That's going to be something to see. Something to see. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your glory, for your goodness, for your grace. Lord, it's, it's, it's interesting, it's fascinating to us to study about these marvelous creatures that you made that are sent down here, Lord, to minister to us, lowly, unworthy, undeserving sinners, but, but people that you have blessed so abundantly, Lord. And God, we know one day we'll see them, we'll see them all, uh, and, and, and we'll be amazed by, their, by their, their glory, their beauty, their awesome power. But God, how, how wonderfully blessed we're going to be when you, we see your glory that outshines them all. And we thank you, Lord, for the glory that shines in our heart even now, even though that we've not seen you face to face. Lord, it, it, it's a wonderful privilege just, just to think about that time, Lord, when when we'll be gathered together in your presence. Lord, help us in this time of, of difficulty and, and, and darkness and depression. Um, help us, Lord, to shine as lights in this world of darkness. Um, we know that you gave to the angels a, 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 a luminous body of light. But Lord, you've given to us your light. And, and we pray that, that you would help us that your light would shine in us and, and shine in this world of darkness, that it might help somebody along the way come to know you as Lord and Savior. Bless all of these that have been mentioned tonight, Lord, in, in need of, of healing, especially remember the unsaved. Bless us and use us, we pray, to accomplish your will and purpose. And we'll praise you for all these things in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Thank you again for coming in.